Greetings to all in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I'm facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found in the list of study groups found on the L&L research page shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook under Seattle Law of One study group. We do meet on Zoom twice a week. We meet on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, as well as Saturdays from 8 to 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You don't have to live anywhere in the Seattle area to join our Facebook group or join our discussions. Anyone who's interested and available is welcome to join us. We do also have a YouTube channel that can be found under Seattle Law One Study Group. That's where we keep recordings of previous Q&A sessions with Jim, Austin, Trish, Gary, uh, and invite you to enjoy them there. Speaking of which, uh, we do also want to announce that uh, l, l Research did recently announce that they do have a coming home to a new Earth gathering that's coming up on October 12th through 15th, and it is actually going to be in Seebeck, Washington, which is about an hour out of Seattle. So anyone who lives anywhere near the Seattle area in traveling distance is uh, welcome to join us. I believe registration opened uh, last week and is still available. If you want to register, just go to the l, l Research page shown in your site, click on the News link. And if you click on that uh, link that's there, that'll take you to uh, information and registration stuff. Otherwise, we are blessed again today to be joined by Jim McCarty for some conversation and questions and answers about the law of one. How are you doing, Jim? Doing well today. Yeah, it's been a good day so far. <laughs> good. We're so glad, uh, thankful you can join us. I did want to note uh, that uh, most people uh, have heard of Roswell, New Mexico, Area 51, and its associations with the UFO craze that started in this country uh, back in the late 40s and continues to this day. Uh, but most people probably don't know that two weeks before the Roswell incident uh, in the summer of 1947 was the Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting that happened near Mount Rainier in Washington State. Uh, that gave rise to the term flying saucer. That's the term that was used in the uh, news reports uh, of that time. And uh, uh, Jim, I did want to ask you, do you know if Don ever met Kenneth Arnold? Since I know Don- Not to my knowledge. Traveling around. No, not to my knowledge. He uh, met some other people that had had uh, encounters with UFOs in the late 40s and early 50s. George oh. Adamski and George Hunt Williamson out in California. And then a fellow in um, Detroit, uh, Michigan, um, uh, had a, an encounter. And that was part of the beginning of the uh, channeling process at l Research. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, I know I've heard a little bit about uh, Don's travels and I believe Carla went with him also. They flew a fair bit around the country trying to find People right. who had UFO contact experiences. Yeah, Don had been flying since he was 17 years old. So, uh, and he also flew for Eastern Airlines later on. But uh, on his own time, he and Carla would take small craft uh, out of Bowman Field here in Kentucky and um, go wherever there was a report of somebody who had been uh, taken on board or seen a UFO or had some kind of a UFO experience. So that's where he gathered a lot of his information. Uh, in 1960 or 76, they published uh, Secrets of the UFO as a result of that uh, amount of that investigation they did. This is Bosco. He likes to be in podcasts too. <laughs> he doesn't answer questions. I know. <laughs> Pretty big. That is uh, not Mr. Mush then? No, this is a downstairs cat. This is Bosco. He's a uh, Doing a little better than Bush, although Bosco's got diabetes, so I have to give him insulin twice a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, we wish them both well, and thank you for being such a good friend to them. Uh, Jim, I had another question that I wanted to ask related to something that I believe you shared with us last time. We were talking a little bit about your uh, morning offering that you always do and always uh, open up your Camelot journal with. 
And I believe you said something about meditating for about two hours as part of that. Am I remembering that correctly? I meditate for about an hour and a half. And then I have uh, readings from uh, different books, including the Law of One and the Bible and Joel Goldsmith and prayers and singing and so forth. It takes up another half hours. So all, all together, it's about two hours. Wow. But hour and a half meditation, I was wondering uh, for folks who are new to meditation or folks whose meditation practices don't usually go for that length of time, would you mind sharing us a little bit? Like, how does that work for you? What, what are you thinking about <laughs> for that hour and a half? Do you let whatever thoughts come to you rise and fall? Are you focused on anything in particular? Do you do visualizations or anything? It's a early morning meditation. I start at about four o'clock in the morning. And I've discovered it's easier to meditate longer uh, in the dark. And uh, I don't, I try not to think about anything, but that's hard to do, you know. Uh, what I'm trying to do uh, in this particular type of meditation is something that uh, was a product or a, began as an inner guidance. Um, that uh, meditation could be helpful to me. And what my goal is, is to activate the uh, indigo ray and violet ray chakras and to have more of a, I guess you might say a contact with uh, the creator or the father, however you like to look at uh, the one infinite creator that Ra describes. And um, that's basically it. Uh, it's, it's not something that you know, comes through in words usually, although that can happen. Uh, it's usually something that is, uh, as Carla said, it was uh, those types of communications are uh, thoughts that are too deep for words. And usually it's something that can become a guide for you for the rest of the day, kind of a, a way of uh, setting the foundation of the day. The rule of life is what Carla called it. And uh, so as the day goes on, uh, my second meditation is about an, about an hour long and the others uh, I meditate uh, six times altogether and they're about half an hour long. So that's my- All of those meditations, you're doing more or less the same practice, same approach? Right, right. Fascinating. Would you say that uh, square breathing is a part of the work, the focus that you do on your uh, third eye chakra? Yes, I have a, a it's a deep breathing type of a technique that uh, where I hold my breath at the beginning and then a deep inhale, hold my breath and then exhale and keep going back and forth in just a, a rhythmic manner. Nice. And am I remembering correctly that that was something that uh, Carla actually brought to you or showed to you in a dream sometime not long after her passing into a larger life? I seem to remember you're saying something about that a while ago. Yes, uh, it was um, a dream that I had uh, a number of dreams after she passed away for the following year. I guess I had about 100 dreams with her in them. And some of them were really inspiring. And this particular one you're talking about was one where uh, she just gave me this idea uh, to how to discover the secrets of the law of one or the secrets of self-realization. And uh, so after that, um, there was another message given and it turned into my way of meditating. Yeah. I've been doing the square breathing technique for, uh, I don't know, at least a year, I think. And I have found for me personally, yeah, it, it, it does help me to get into a particular good meditative state of mind. I can't say I've found it is helping me activate my uh, third eye chakra in any particular way, although I'm not really focused on trying to do that either. Can you share a little bit about how the breathing uh, practice works for you in doing that? Well, uh, basically my, I think my third eye and the, the violet ray as well have been activated for quite a while. And so what I'm doing is to um, 
intensify what's already there. And I, I focus my inner eye on the third eye while I'm doing that technique. And this is a, my own particular way of doing it. You know, you know, you can give it a try, but it may or may not work for you, for you. I think each of us can develop our own way of meditating that is most helpful to us. And, and you do it just by, you know, trying one way or try another way and see what works for you. For sure. Yeah, I appreciate your sharing that. And I know our friends in the Confederation have said so many times that meditation is really unique <laughs> for each, right. each individual. They find a way that works for them, kind of like you said, through experimentation and trial and error. So, yeah, thank you uh, for sharing that. I do want to go ahead to the chat window because I do see quite a number of questions in there. I will probably be uh, inviting people to ask their questions in the order that I see them in the chat window just so you know, for those of you on the call. And I also wanted to invite anyone who hasn't asked a question yet. Yeah, if you will go ahead and type your question in the chat window or just tell me the subject of your question, then I can put you in the queue and, and the order and we will make sure that everyone gets to ask their question. So Wes, I believe you're first up. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask a question? Yes, thank you. I'm just going to read my question. Um... I've made my journey away from fundamentalist Christianity and back several decades later to the essence of the being who appeared to us as Jesus. And I'd like to hear your thoughts, Jim, on integrating other positive spiritual understandings with the law of one. Well, um, we have a fellow that's uh, a good friend of Elna Research who is doing a book on how the law of one aligns with the mystical aspect of the five major religions of the world, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. It's, it's what's called the perennial philosophy. And it's the philosophy that uh, we are all one being and that being is contained within us and within every portion of the creation. And the one known as Jesus was a, a very effective uh, prophet and uh, dispenser of basically the law of one. And that uh, people around the world have discovered more of their own inner seeking and the quality of the inner seeking where any of these religions uh, can become part of their spiritual process of evolving in mind, body, and spirit, and becoming able to open their hearts in unconditional love to everyone around them, at least 51% of the time. Now, that's not contained in most of the religions, but here in the third density, Ross suggested that that is enough to just point the needle of your spiritual journey in the direction of the open heart, which is what we're all trying to learn here. And I believe all of the other major religions have that quality as well. In the mystical aspect, not the dogmatic aspect, the dogmatic aspect, I think is what you're probably familiar with where, you know, certain entities of the hierarchy of any particular religion determine what the believers need to believe. And uh, so in the mystical aspect, you get a chance to discover that for yourself. And uh, each person is unique in that regard. Although within certain boundaries, you might say, or uh, guidelines, uh, we all progress together by opening our hearts in unconditional love. It's a great question, Wes. Thanks for asking. Did you have any follow-ups? Um, only to say that I'm really looking forward to reading that book, yes. I've done my journey into mysticism as well in, in the Christian tradition and some Eastern traditions as well. well thank you very much. And thank you for your question. Indeed. Uh, I saw that Siwen had a couple questions about channeling, and then I did see that a number of folks also have other questions about channeling. So I might invite the folks who had the questions about channeling in particular to ask those uh, together. So when did you want to start off? If you have a couple questions, go for it. Okay, hi. Uh, hi, James. Thank you hi, for 
asking our uh, answer our question. So uh, first, just a quick question about channeling. During the channeling of Ra, I know you are there meditating and sending um, energy to Carla, but do you actually listen to the answers and process it while, while you're doing that? I did to the best of my ability. Um, I don't know if you've heard, if you've been to our website, you've heard how uh, the raw contact was spoken by Carla. It was yeah. very slow and each syllable was very carefully enunciated. And it was always very uh, amazing to me that Don could listen and get the gist of the, the answer and then make another question up. Because uh, when I was transcribing it afterwards, uh, sometimes I had a little trouble figuring out where the end of a sentence was and where the next one began. So when I was sending energy to Carla during the contact, I was peripherally aware of what was being said, but I wasn't concentrating on that. I wasn't trying to figure it out like Don would, because my job uh, was to try to help the contact uh, flow through Carla as easily as possible by sending uh, love and light to her violet ray chakra and seeing it go down through all the other chakras and back out the red ray and forming a kind of a, uh, an ellipse or a, you know elongated circle there. So that the, hopefully that the energies uh, then could be uh, used to help the raw contact continue. That's a great question. Did you have more, Sue? Yeah, I just have another. Hopefully, quick question is when I want to know more about how the channeling of coal comes about. Like I know it happened in eighty six. Um, were you before that just channeling other confederation entities? Then suddenly, uh, this new entity come through, and uh, uh, like what was coal's energy different? And uh, like, was it usually Carla gets it first, then, then everybody else also will be able to receive from it. Um, and uh, like, um, how, how did you ask Cole how to spell it? <laughs> or uh, you just spell it based on the sound? Um, just, just in general, more information on that if you can. Okay. Uh, after the raw contact ended in 1984, uh, for the next two years, we were channeling previous confederation contacts, such as uh, La Tui, which was of the fifth density, and occasionally Oxal, also of the fifth density. And one of the first we ever started with was Hatan of the fourth density. So in 86, uh, Carla was the first one to pick up uh, Quo. And when we asked Quo who they were, uh, they mentioned that they were what would be called a spiritual principle. All of the others I mentioned, like Hatan, Latui, and, and Ra, were social memory complexes or planetary minds. Ra was composed of 6.5 million people. We don't know the numbers for Latui or Hatan, <clears throat> but Quo said that they were, con they were composed of Hatan of the fourth density and Latui of the fifth density. And in kind of a, what they called a step down fashion, Ra was also part of Quo. And Latui was usually the one that gave voice to the contact that became Quo. And they did let us know how to spell the name, uh, but they didn't exactly tell us who they were for a while. But Carl and I both had taken Latin in high school and, and Quo in Latin usually means who or what. So the name they chose sort of was, uh, and, indication or an invitation for us to ask who they were so eventually we did and since then uh, that's the same contact we have been channeling uh, up to this day we still channel those of quo and most of the uh, people who channel uh, quo uh, ha well each has their own way sometimes a word by word or phrases but carla and then one of our current channels, Austin as well, got the, um, Im the image of uh, concepts, a ball of concepts that would be unraveled as Carla began to channel. And it was her job, she felt, to 
unravel this ball of concepts in a way which like if you go to sell it and <laughs> you're not going to run into trouble but in case the police were ever investigating yeah, like, robbery, yeah anything yeah you just have that as backup with the invoice that sorry about that uh this is why we ask everyone to keep their mics muted while we're meeting thank you sorry uh jim sorry for the interruption uh and mike i i muted your mic too so you'll have to unmute uh let's see my uh jim i believe your mic is still muted Okay, when Carla was unraveling the ball of concepts, she felt that it was her responsibility to do it in a manner which did not uh, change the meaning, that this ball of concepts was something that she could become aware of and begin speaking. And I know so many times after the, the, uh, the challenge were over, she said, you know, there was so much more left, but we just didn't have time for it all. <laughs> so it, it sort of uh, suggested that answers could be uh, very lengthy, that they would be connected to uh, numerous concepts. So that was the way she did uh, My particular way is uh, either words or phrases, and uh, that seems to work. I always ask Quo to do you know, whatever feels the best for me at that time, words, phrases, or even concepts. You know, I'm, up for it all. That is fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Sue Wen, did you have any follow ups on that? Um, no. Um, thank you for your answer. I, I see other people have related questions. I think that, that will answer my other question. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Wen. I did have one uh, follow up on that, maybe a little bit of a clarification, because I do remember it might have been in a QA with. Gary and Austin a while back where they did talk a little bit about the the, the concept balls and I uh, one of them uh, maybe Austin said something to the effect that when they receive this concept ball it means they could start wherever they want on it and once they start kind of maybe like a ball of yarn or something, when you start following that train of thought, it just kind of leads you here and there, but you could pick another part of the concept to start exploring it would lead somewhere else. Is that sort of your understanding of how that works? Basically, that's it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how Carla decided where to begin. I think she left that up to Quo and then just went with the flow, shall we say. Yeah, it's a fascinating thought, you know, as opposed to just one linear sequential stream of words or phrases that it's a more three dimensional <laughs> spherical communication that has different dimensions, different avenues for exploration, I think is, is fascinating. Uh, I believe Kathleen also had a question related to channeling and to quote. Kathleen, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, lots of great questions and great answers. And thank you, Jim, for being with us again. It's a delight and a privilege to uh, share information, the, the raw material and your experiences with it. And whew, I'm just amazed at the conversation thus far. Um, my question was about um, how you physically feel like the migration of those of Quo or those of the Twi or whomever it is, <clears throat> excuse me, that you may, may be bringing through at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in terms of like period of time that you feel, because I mean, I often feel my guardians slash other like accompaniment, my um, non-physical um, presences most of the time but like during my meditations and during my equivalent of what you do as your ritual in the mornings um i can sort of feel connected um but of course i'm not like actually or officially channeling so i'm just wondering like when in your engagement with those of quo and others whom you channel um do you 
feel their presence like coming in or do you feel like the beginning of those downloads before like you're being questioned or or like you obviously probably like in the group with uh with the team you have someone who's doing the questioning and then you're responding as quo or for quo and and but even before those gatherings do you feel them like around quote unquote and if so um do, do you find that really like helpful or do you find it like uh a little interruptive because i mean i i don't mean to sound like any negative any negative connotation to that but i mean i'm like trying to do various activities and i feel the presences and it makes me a little unsure like if i should just keep doing what i'm doing or now i need to go back and meditate more because i feel them around you know what i mean so i think we got the question a really little bit of a mismatch thank you yeah. thank you very much well thank you for your question um when we are engaged in channeling quo we are practicing a technique that carla gave us uh, back in 2008 when she had a channeling circle that was attempting to learn how to channel then so at that time she got uh, a series of uh, i guess you call preparations uh, how we could tune ourselves to uh, our highest and best how we could um, also she felt it was necessary to know who you got on the line uh, so she said that we needed to challenge any entity that wishes to speak through us every time we channeled and that would be done by discovering first what the heart of our spiritual journey was and then be able to channel uh, when the entity could say they uh, were in alignment with that in other words for carla the heart of her spiritual journey was jesus christ and so she would uh, challenge any entity who wished to speak through her three times do you come in the name of jesus christ and you can you say that jesus christ is lord so uh after she passed away i also adopted that same technique before that i, I challenged the name of christ consciousness but that is something that she felt was very important however when you are having your experiences uh, you may or may not be in contact with your own guides uh, your higher self your subconscious mind uh, ross suggested we each have a, a male guide a female guide and an androgynous guide so if you are in contact with any of those the challenge is not necessary because you are channeling a part of yourself and that does not require the type of challenge that carla recommended for what we have always called extraterrestrial types of entities because these entities uh, from elsewhere could also be negatively oriented there seems to be a uh, what the council of saturn has described as the the right of the all entities positive and negative to be heard through any uh, channeling of extraterrestrial sources so oftentimes when you're channeling extraterrestrial sources if you do not challenge then sometimes negatively oriented entities will take over the channel and pretend to give positive information and then slowly turn it into a negative fashion so many positively oriented channels over the years have been uh, had their light put out you might say by having mixed mixed information is the way that rod described it so this is something that's necessary if you're channeling extraterrestrials but not necessary for channeling your own guidance any follow-ups on that very Kathy? very much thank you i appreciate this answer and i have to say that was a very important distinction that i needed to make and that was that when it's my own inner intuitive innately known since i was this big or smaller before then um that that's my own essence and i don't have to question it that's giving self-doubt which is a roadblock for that free flow of that intuitive information that you'll naturally receive when you're meditating and praying and and focusing on service to others and you know uh polarizing and 
you know, dealing with with catalysts and such. And I just wanted to know because I I uh, know other people who channel, but uh, they're they're not like Quo or Law of One oriented. And um, I get the sense that they are like ever present. Like when Ra was channeling through Carla, of course he would say that because of the frailty of the instrument, they had to limit and and you know really kind of cram a lot of information into short periods of time. And um, that idea of them kind of feeling them around or whatever probably wasn't that prevalent, prevalent because of the need for that really refined frequency for them to come through. So it's really fascinating to me how uh, there are nuances uh, within these communications from our other dimensional other self and such. So thank you so very much for being here and for the awesome answer to my question. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, yeah narrow band, I believe was the term that they would use for that fragile uh, uh, channel that they have with Carla. Jim, uh, if you don't mind my asking a follow-up, is it not possible then for a negative entity to pretend to be your higher self or your spirit guides or something other than an extraterrestrial entity? If you challenge like Carla did in the name of Jesus, or if you use Buddha or Lao Tzu or any well-known entity like that, it's like having the entity standing there with you. And negative entities don't dare lie to such like Jesus or Buddha or whatever your particular heart of your way is, because it's the purity of your desire to be of service to that entity and the qualities that entity uh, manifested in the, you know their life or um, that you are attempting to manifest as well. That's the, uh, it's, it's always worked. We have never had any negative entity be able to channel through any of our instruments over the years. Right. When they use well, the tuning process. I was only asking because I think if I understood your uh, response correctly to Kathleen, you were saying that it's probably not necessarily necessary to challenge when you're trying to make contact with your higher self or your inner guides right. because it's a different process. And I was just wondering yeah. if it's not possible or likely that a negative entity would try to masquerade themselves as your well now that's where i can't say for sure i mean uh carla always felt it was not possible um and i don't believe it's possible but i've i've never you know been in that situation where i was trying to channel my own guidance so i, I can't speak from experience that's good yeah thank you thank you for uh clarifications uh, I believe Tony had a question about challenge or channeling also. Tony and then Aram after that. Would you like to uh, unmute your mic and ask? Are you there, Tony? Yeah, one sec. Uh, how's that? Is that working? Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, um, I've done some past life regression work uh, in the past couple of years and I'm used to kind of holding the space for the person um, having the experience. And I'm just curious, um, when you guys start to channel raw, um, did you notice like a presence, uh, like come into the room and then over the years, did it, did it evolve? Like, were you able to recognize raw and that kind of thing as an entity or how did that, go about because obviously you know you're tuning into a, a consciousness i'm just wondering if it if there's anything about it that you recognize that stood out uh no we, we uh we were not able to feel raw's presence because raw was not actually with carla carla was with raw in the inner planes right. of earth so raw was using carla's lips and mouth and tongue to form words in answer to Don's questions. So uh, there, there was really no presence that was there. And for Carla, she was totally unaware of what was going on. For her, the raw contact was like going to sleep and then waking up. So wow. it, was, it was much different than 
any other trans contact that I'd ever heard of. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. And uh, I actually wanted to comment too about um, you were mentioning before, or the talk was about um, like previously that there was um, some ball of an entanglement to unwind. And then uh, Jonathan was saying how it seemed like it could make sense that it could be like a three dimensional object that was being untangled or something, you know, and has these layers or whatever. Right. So um, I just want to comment on that because. Um, I'm trying to move my mic around or my picture around so I can see who's talking, but uh, or who's uh, responding. But anyway, so um, when I was 17, I had uh, I fasted for a couple of weeks, did a lot of praying, and I was uh, greeted by four Orion entities, and this was in probably 1998, and I didn't know anything about any of that stuff, and then wasn't until 2012 when I see, seen a lot of one books and ended up reading exactly what what transpired and what happened and the contact I had and information I was shared and so during that time from 17 onwards I ended up um, trying to understand what happened um, and I I went to all the different religions to try and see if there's like any kind of talk about extraterrestrials and how they contact and all that kind of stuff and I ended up modeling um, a th three-dimensional ball of light that had multi-dimensional layers. And I used a lot of the stuff that Ra talks about in terms of like the energy coming from the pyramids, the different density levels, how they interact. And then I created uh, a three-dimensional shape that you could put over top of the, the pyramids and then see what Ra was talking about. And um, a Did lot of the concept- about it in particular, Tony? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering if there was- um, anything in the like raw material about um, there being like hidden downloads within the material, because that's what I was getting when I was reading it. I was seeing so much other stuff other than what was being talking about. And I modeled it and, and I just want to know if, if that was something that was um, part of the transmission that raw talked about, like there was more to what was being given and there was a lot more in it. Well, in a way, I think that's possible, but I don't think it's necessarily just in the material. Carla always said that as your own spiritual journey progresses and you reread the Law of One or the raw material, it meets you at a different level, determined by where you are at that time. So I think that in that way, uh, you could say that there are layers of understanding but they're also part of what you bring forth to the reading as you progress on your spiritual journey right right awesome okay well thanks so much for all your uh, input it's great love it thank you for great your questions. questions appreciate it thanks for uh asking uh Aram, did you also have a question about channeling yeah um I do have a question and it, it feels a little bit related to things people have already asked. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there a, a felt sense of the different, um, you know, uh, entities that you channel, like Le Tui, does it feel different from um, Ra or Kuo or Hatan? Can you recognize them? Um, I don't know, do they have a different energy signature that you can feel or do you, does it become obvious once you start channeling them? Like when they say who they are, um, I guess that, <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I think for the uh, instruments or channels that are more sensitive, that there is a way of feeling the difference between the, diff the different uh, sources of the channeling. Uh, Hetan and Latos are two entities that are of the fourth density of love. And it seems that with them, many of the people who have been in our channeling circle over the years say that it is a very uh, relaxing and comforting and uh, supportive kind of feeling they get when they channel the fourth density. And the fifth density, Latui, Oxal, Lalima, 
uh, there is kind of a, an extension of uh, energy there. This, it's a higher vibration that uh, it partakes of wisdom and it, it has more of a, a specific feeling of uh, um, just being a, a higher vibration. I, I guess that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, it it's not quite as settling or comforting. It, um, it, it moves into to your higher chakras. And uh, Carla was the only one that ever channeled her off. So, and she wasn't there to get any feeling for it. So I can only imagine, you know, what that must have been like. I mean, so that's the best I can do on that. What a great question. What a fascinating uh, response. Uh, Aram, did you have any follow-ups on that? Um, I do have a follow-up, but it's not about channeling. Is it okay if I ask about meditation? Could we come back to it? I think there's still a couple other folks with questions about channeling, and I have you on my list. We'll make sure that we double back. And uh, John and Jeffrey, I have not forgotten. I saw your questions, but trying to get all the questions related to channeling together, if you don't mind. Uh, let's see. And uh, David, I know you've been waiting for a while to ask about channeling. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Yes. Hi, Jim and everyone. Um, I had a question regarding when Carla was channeling and sometimes the, um, the negative fifth density, um, negative fifth density entity would um, try, it was something about a risk, a risk that Carla could be displaced into negative time space. And I just, can't wrap my head around like what is negative time space and like is it like a, another timeline or dimension or do you have any thoughts about or explanations about negative time space well not a lot we didn't get a lot of information there about that but what caused the possibility of that occurring was uh, one particular channeling uh, where Carla thought to herself when she heard the question I wish I was channeling raw. I have no idea about the answer to this question. And because her will was so strong, uh, just that little desire to know what Ra would think about it and how it would answer was enough to cause her to start leaving her body. And that was the desire of our negative friend of fifth density was to be able to get her out of her body and to lead her into what Ra called negative time space. Now, I'm guessing that the negative time space differs from the positive time space. And this is just a guess in that there is much more darkness and separation, whereas in positive time space, there is the light and the unification. The, the nature of reality is more clearly reflected there. The negative entities do see the creator as that which they wish to become. They do see the creator is within them. And that, that's totally correct but they separate themselves from each other and all other people as well in order to try to control them and gain their power. So this is a, a maneuver of uh, Ra called that which is not. And that which is not is, is, is not light. It is not unity. It is not love. It is darkness. It is separation. It is control. So that would be my best answer for you. And again, okay. it's my opinion. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. That's a great question, David. And I know other folks on the chat window are uh, thanking you for asking that too. Jim, do you think it would be f fair to say, and again, I'm just guessing on this too, do you think being displaced in a negative time space would be akin to being hijacked from positive graduation into fourth density into like graduation into a negative fourth density, fifth density? Track. Well, basically, yeah. Uh, Ra suggested that any entity in such a situation uh, would need to be able to gather enough power in that realm of negativity so that eventually they could reverse their polarity and go back into positive polarity. But they also suggested that positively oriented entities are not good students of the negative path. And it would be a very lengthy path. Although, as they said, in the end, all would turn out well. And apparently, you know, on, when they were on Venus, 
um, there were two positive fifth density wanderers who were going to attempt to uh, serve those of uh, Venus in a positive sense, but do it in a way that was in conjunction with many of the population of Venus thought that those of Ra, their, their love and devotion to each other and the way they expressed it was sickening. And they wanted a more wisdom oriented you know, way. So uh, these two wanderers incarnated and the wisdom oriented way turned out to be that which was negativity. They changed their polarity there. And they were able to be graduated though they were the only ones in negative polarity. And after they discovered they'd switched their polarity, uh, Ross suggested they were disconcerted. <laughs> and it took them a great deal of time to do just what Ross said would need to be done to become negative entities in order to gain the power to eventually switch their polarity back to positive. Yeah, yeah. I have mulled that over time and time and again and still can't quite wrap my head around it because they would have had to have been 95 plus percent service to self in order yeah. to graduate negative on a planet that was otherwise positive, right? And they'd have to learn, you know, how to do, get that power back in the negative sense. And, you know, that would be something you learn trial and error. It might take a while. Yeah. It would be I'll against all that. your normal intuition <laughs> and your past process. To be sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And uh, again, David, thank you for uh, asking the question. Uh, I know that Susan had something in the chat window that may or may not have been answered so far. So Susan, I'm going to invite you to, if you still have a question that you would like to ask, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> so I wrote in the chat, um, it's not in front of me, but I wrote in the chat, what are the thoughts on raw being around today? And I got from what Jim said about, um, and I haven't read all of the, uh, the transcripts, the channeling in the archives, but I got the um, answer that through other, um, through other channelers, the raw is coming through. So I described it like a radio station picking up another radio station. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on raw being around today? Um, due to the commitment that the experience with the Egyptians, uh, the commitment was made for Ra to, to stick around. So thank you. Well, um, aside from Ra being part of the uh, principle of Quo, uh, to our knowledge, there isn't anyone channeling those of Ra at this time, although there have been people who felt that they were channeling Ra. Um, I believe that at this time, Ra is probably, and this is, again is my opinion, uh, available to people within the dream state, especially to wanderers, which has been a way they have contacted uh, people on earth for uh, thousands of years, so that they would have an inspirational dream or intuition inside of some kind that helped them to re realize their nature as being a wanderer and to awaken to the purpose of their mission, the reason for their life on earth. So uh, other than that, I'm not aware of anybody who's actually been channeling raw. Right, I, um, I got that also. I, I, do, I agree with you. What I'm getting is a sense of, and then you, I put the pieces together when you, when you shared your meditation, the six times a day, and then the hour and a half in the morning, um, so I also think that that is a possibility of raw being able to come through during that state, which is different than the dream state. But um, so I would like to add that, that it's possible um, during meditation. And then some people get to a level of meditation, whether it's however it's described, walking meditation or Jim, I'm sure you experience this and more and more and more the the meditation state and then the 3d reality state the merging of those two or the there's 
the medicine, the meditation state becomes the, uh, the walking, the state of being, even while in the, the existence that we're in. So I think that that is one way that the raw communication can come through, but not as channeling as uh, memories, as blocks of information, pictures, um, feeling, um, the sharings like that, but not channeling, not like, not what Carla did. I understand that that was a unique and distinct experience. So um, like how- Was like there a how Carla, question? Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Like how Carla experienced Jesus. I think it's possible to experience raw that way. So, um, if that makes sense. So the question is, um, raw committed to staying, uh, to staying near planet earth or to watch out for planet earth for humanity. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I believe that uh, all of the Confederation sources, uh, such as raw have always said throughout the years, that they would be available to us, to anybody who was a channel, to anybody who came to a channeling session, to anybody who they really asked, it would be available to join them in their meditations. They would not speak any words. They would just lend their vibrations to the meditation and become part of it in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Indeed. Uh, I am looking at my clock and seeing that we are approaching the end of our hour for today. So I did want to make sure that John and Jeffrey and Luke and Don and Aram had a chance to ask the questions that they still have. So uh, I would only ask that people when you ask your questions, if you kind of keep it on the shorter side and to the point so that everyone has a chance to ask. That would be wonderful. Uh, John, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? I think you had a question about the tarot. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so first of all, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for putting me on a spiritual journey for the past 10 years. And I'm so thankful for you and Carlos and Don's work. I will, uh, I will share... Uh, uh, a quote from you where you say this is about the the choosing between the, the second choice in the raw raw books about choosing between astrology uh, the tarot and magic and you say we didn't think we had the right discipline or time to undertake ceremonial magical work. That is a work that would take a great deal of energy and might even detract from what we were doing with the raw contact, in our opinions at the time. That's the quote. And then I, my question is, what is your preconception of a magician and what practices would take so much time compared to studying the tarot? That is my question. Thank you. Well, I remember uh, making that statement. And I think at the time, the reason I said that uh, was that while we were in the last stages of the raw contact, that we had to work so hard just to get Don and Carla, especially uh, physically and mentally in the condition necessary to have that raw contact. And that if we had to add more work, such as the working to become the white magician and working with a magical personality, that would probably be too much. And that was unfortunate because I think that uh, we all, well, Don before the raw contact had worked a great deal with uh, being a white magician. He was into ceremonial magic and he knew a great deal about it. But Carl and I would need to work pretty hard to, to come up to where he was in that understanding. So it was just a matter of how to mag or how to use our energies most efficiently, and that uh, unfortunately at that time meant that we were going to have to focus more on just being able to have sessions, and that was the way it was. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your question. Thank you, John. 
Uh, Jeffrey, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, and I'm delighted to be here uh, today. And Jim, I'm curious about, um, you know, our one thing Rob brought forward is that when we're in our life mission, we can avoid a lot of catalyst. And I think the best way to avoid catalyst is to know what your mission is. And having been performing past life regression over the years, I've seen, you know, people ask, what's my life mission and all this. Um, the key to, for me that I've been wondering all this time is, why does certain catalysts present at this particular time in our life? Let's say if it's related to a past life experience. And I know you as somebody who's very conscious and aware and familiar with this idea uh, might have an answer because I can think of certain answers uh, why certain catalysts would present. You know, for instance, perhaps we're strong enough on our journey at this point, or perhaps there's a trigger what are your thoughts on this? I've been very curious about this idea over the years. Thank you. Well, yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, Ross suggested that our pre-incarnated choices are usually determined by a review and healing of the previous incarnation and where there are certain signposts that have not been utilized in the previous incarnation then they are reinstalled, you might say, in the upcoming incarnation. So that we'll have another chance to use them because Ross suggested catalyst was food for growth. And it was something that if we would be able to process the catalyst and use it, that it could become part of our spiritual journey that allowed us to become what Ra called a 360 degree being, to realize that we are all things, that the creator is within us, the creator is all things. The creator has created everything to get to know itself better. So here we are in the third density, the density of choice. And to be able to make a choice of polarization of positive or negative, we have to be able to utilize the catalyst that we have not utilized before. And there is a great deal of that catalyst. It takes many incarnations to be able to see that we are all things. Every catalyst, positive or negative, that comes our way is a part of that 360 degree being that is the creator. So basically the equation is that Ra gave us, uh, know yourself as through your catalyst, accept yourself for having all of that catalyst and then become the creator. And that is a, a journey of many lifetimes. And it means that we need to use all the catalysts. And so, uh, that seems to be the way it works. So do you think that certain catalysts approach us at a certain time in our life because our pre-incarnative plan called it forward at that time or something that potentially other triggers like, okay, now I haven't used all these. Now I'll try this one. Curious. It could well that. be either one. Okay. We're all unique. Uh, I don't <laughs> think there's one set answer on that. Uh, it could be the right time for the catalyst to present itself. It could be that it's new catalyst uh, and it needs to be dealt with because it you know, appeared in your life at a certain time. So it, uh, you know, it, it, it could be any of a number of things. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Great to meet you today, Jim. Well, thank you for your question. Great questions indeed. Thank you. Uh, Luke, do you have a question you would like to ask? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, I will try to keep it short. Yeah, so thanks for your time, uh, Jim, and uh, you know, answering the question and spreading the knowledge of a uh, law of one. Uh, so I've recently stumbled stumbled upon some information that uh, similarly related to law of one. So in some uh, aging countries, uh, you know, there's some like uh, Dao followers and some uh, you know top researcher have done some extensive study uh, on a, a somatic science. So like for example, one study some like university professor, you know, uh, working with some Tao followers, they, uh, you know, a place a phone inside a, an upside down ball. And then they, they tell the, uh, the Tao uh, followers to use their, you know, mental power, psychic power to make the phone a fly away. And then literally that its path can be tracked via the GPS, right? So it literally physically fly away, miles and miles away. And so they claim that it is achieved by projecting their thoughts into a uh, imaginary uh, space. Uh, this imaginary is like the sort of the mass term, right? imaginary versus real number, right? And then I think uh, through they, they done this through channeling an entity 
or teacher or directly sort of uh, communicate to the project to, to the object and asking them to do it um so so i guess i'm wondering so if you think this uh, sort of a imaginary or complex space is is basically the uh, time space realm in uh, raw material uh, and the follow-up question is uh uh, like, what do you think channel links a relationship with uh, time space? Well, I've got to say that I don't have a lot of experience with the uh, concept uh, that you're discussing. Uh, I would imagine that something like that would be very possible, that it would be something that somebody could utilize if they had certain powers of mind. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the spiritual value of such would be. Uh, and as far as uh, what they might be channeling, I don't know if it would be uh, an inner planes guide, their higher self, or uh, their uh, mind by spirit complex totality, or their unconscious mind. Um, all of those are possibilities. Um, I just I don't have enough information to know. Uh, but my feeling about it is that it is not something that is really important on the spiritual path to be able to provide these kinds of uh, paranormal demonstrations of the power of the mind. I think we need to be more concerned with how we open our hearts and see each other as each other's love other self and learn how to love and serve each other rather than impress each other with what we can do with our mind. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Got it. Yeah, thanks a lot for the answer. So a real quick follow up is uh, like, what do you think uh, uh, the relationship between channeling and uh, time space, I guess? Well, different? I think it's a connection uh, between time, space, and space time. I think that the entities who are doing the channeling from the Confederation of Planets and the Service of the Infinite Creator are in time space, and they are giving us information, we who are in space time, so that we can become more spiritually oriented and begin to uh, utilize the time space portion of our own beings in our spiritual journeys. So I think that that is something that it's a uh, been the true for for years and years in the channeling process that's what is being offered to the channel to not only be able to provide uh, the channel an ability to move forward in its spiritual journey but the channel can then share that information from the time space confederation with others that might benefit from it and be able to move further ahead in their own spiritual journeys thanks for the answer thank you for your question Jim, for uh, people who are watching who might not be real clear on the difference between space-time and time-space, <laughs> could you briefly <laughs> give a little bit of clarification on that? Uh, space-time is where we're located right here. This is the practical world. This is uh, the mundane world uh, where we're conscious of our lives. Uh, and it is the physical world. Time-space is the metaphysical world. It's the spiritual world. It's the place where we all go, where we drop our bodies and walk into the light and are once again reunited with that place where we're from. Uh, whether we're a wanderer or a third density entity, um, this is where the greater reality is revealed to us because there's no longer a veil of forgetting that keeps us from seeing the true nature of reality as being unity, love and light. So thank you very much. We have time for about three more questions. So I am seeing Don and then Mel and then Aram. Uh, Don, do you have a question that you would like to ask still? Um, yes, uh, it's kind of a, I know this, we're running out of time. It's a, in a way it's a multifaceted question in the sense that um, if, when we were talking, when when I had this question in my head a lot better earlier, <laughs> um, basically the, in the raw material, Don talked about a group that was wearing pyramids on their heads to move objects, uh, bend metal, etc. Um, and then also. Um, uh, 
being the people that were um, the elder race, um, I have this feeling that they're the ones that are described throughout history as people that are having elongated heads. Um, and in the way that uh, uh, intelligent energy is focused uh, through the pyramid to bend this metal, is it also possible that um, if that's the case with the elongated heads, um, that this has uh, a similar type of effect? Um, I don't know, this is really conjecture, but, um, but mainly the other thing uh, also about the pyramids, um, is there more information about that as far as who they were, if they're still around, et cetera, too? Thanks. Uh, as far as I know, uh, they're probably not around I me. Mean, that was 40 some years ago. And if you remember when Don asked about that, Rod didn't give a really uh, long answer or uh, an answer that was uh, considered the value of using the pyramids on the head. They kind of uh, shoved it aside and went on to another, another question. Um, What's happening there? The elongated heads. I've I've seen images that you're talking about of the Egyptians around the time of Akhenaten, about 3,300 years ago. I'm not exactly sure why the heads were elongated, or if they actually were elongated, or if that was a symbolic representation of some quality. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of good information for you on the answer to that. Uh, I don't even have you know conjecture. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Um... Thank you for your question. I think it's it. Yep. Can Thank we, you. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple more folks with questions. Uh, Mel, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Jim, I have the question. What was the impact on, like when in the raw material there is, you left personal information in there that was relating to you or to Carla, about your internal processes, about thoughts you have, about problems you might have or may have had, or something that might have had uh, happened in a meditation. And how did that impact your, like after the session, when you talked among each other, like your way forward, knowing that, okay, they know my thoughts and not just you. I mean, there were, you know, people in history where it's like, Ra spoke about their internal processes, like they went one way and then this happened and then they changed their path too. So knowing and hearing that Ra he is aware, now obviously all is one, so yes, is aware, but getting it verbally like spelled out and also um, so, so personalized and like sexual energy transfer situations, whatever, how did that impact you? And how did that impact maybe also the dynamic in the group because being told yes you all know each other you're all wondrous that kind of I, i've wondered about that while reading it so, so i would appreciate asking, if you would want to answer some of it like whatever is not too personal um i'm not sure i exactly understand your query uh you're wondering what Ra was referring to when they mentioned that don no. and carl and i had worked together no more like when you heard that Ra knows about all this, like knows about your thoughts, knows about the internal processes, what everyone is going through, not just you, but also oh. everyone. How okay. did that impact you in terms of your personal path? Like, for example, when you were somewhere, would you think of, oh, Ra is aware of my thoughts now? Like, <laughs> would or would Ra be present in your, the way Jesus might be present with somebody in their, on their path, you know, that, that you kind of like that. And also in the group, how would, those informations, like how would that change the dynamic in the group or, or any, any or the conversations or how you feel or? Mm -hmm. Well, the raw contact in general was just so mind blowing that knowing that they were aware of our thoughts and uh, what our thoughts meant, what uh, they could provide us in our own spiritual journey were just part of a, a, a amazing experience. I mean, everything about the raw contact was mind blowing as far as we knew, because uh, Don and Carl had been channeling for 12 years before I even joined them. And they had 
really inspiring information that uh, had been helpful to so many seekers. But then the raw contact came along and it was something that was totally new. Uh, Carla left her body that had, had no idea she could even do that. And uh, she was with Ra and the information that Ra gave was so um, specific and inspiring and to the point and so rich in information that could be of uh, help to anybody that we just sort of you know accepted that the impossible was possible and it's uh the impossible dream you know and the impossible dream came true so it was a a mountaintop experience for us we, we were just uh so um grateful to be in it and so uh empowered and inspired it, it was just a a journey of a lifetime it's something that we didn't even know it was possible so you know so it did not make you feel uncomfortable then or now knowing that ra or kuo might know your what you're thinking your internal thoughts at any given moment and any given no time. because we we did know and still know that they had what were called the overview they could see the entire picture and whereas we don't see the whole picture here we only see the little part of it that may make us uncomfortable if somebody knows about it but from the greater picture there's a reason for everything ross said all is well there are no mistakes everything has a purpose and so we totally believe that and uh, so it, it was a uh, you know most inspiring um and we just learned how to live with the uh, the incredible the mysterious it's beautiful thank you mel did you have any follow-up questions on that uh, yeah maybe one like did you then um while in it while and um, during that experience during those years and afterwards would you consciously like have thoughts of communicating with those of Ra or or was that not something like not channeling? I mean, like when you go for a walk, would you say, hey, Ra, <laughs> you know, because that's something that changed for me um, after or while reading it. Ra became a presence somehow. It's like I would look up at the stars at night or and I, they would be there or the, the thought of them would be there. And maybe it's the same for some of you guys. So I was wondering, was that the same for you? Uh, we were pretty sure that Ra was always present, that it was just a part of the relationship we had with them. Uh, occasionally, there would be something that would come through that would be very helpful and uh, very easy to perceive. Um, Carl and I were driving back to Kentucky from visiting my mom and dad in Nebraska. And between St. Joseph, Missouri and Kansas City, I was just thinking to myself, you know, I've got so much work to do when I get back and I just don't know how I'm going to get it all done. And I, I said, Ralph, have you got any idea? You know, you could help me out. And that's one of the few times I ever asked. And they said, relax and enjoy. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. What a beautiful story. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And uh, Mel, thank you for your questions. We have time for one more question. And uh, Aram, I'm going to turn it back to you to bring us full circle uh, about meditation. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Jim. Uh, I have a question about meditation. You mentioned earlier specifically about the indigo ray and the violet ray. I'm wondering, have, do, you, do you ever see colors when you meditate? Uh, rarely. I have seen colors. I have seen light. Uh, but it's, it was just, uh, you know, momentary and I have no idea where it came from. I couldn't, uh, you know, cause it to happen again. Uh, and I don't know if it's worth happening again. Uh, occasionally I have seen light, but that's really not the purpose of my meditation, but I'm open to, uh, you know, uh, ramifications or elucidations that might want to occur there, but it's not something that I've been familiar with. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for the question. question. Thank you. And um, that does bring us to a close for this time around. Did want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. And Jim, as always, thank you for your gift of 
time and your open heart and your service to, to others this way. Was there any uh, last thoughts or reflections you wanted to share before we part ways for this time? Well, as always, I appreciate the questions. You know, I don't think, this, this is really odd, over all of the podcasts I've done with this group and with other groups, I don't think I've ever had the same question asked twice. And that is the total indication of what Ross said, that everybody is a unique seeker of truth. And all of us have a, a general journey that we're sharing with each other and we do it in a unique way. And I think this group is just, uh, you know, a perfect example of that. Uh, each of us and, you know, all of you being unique in your search for truth and uh, sharing it with each other. And I'm glad to be a part of your group. I'm always inspired by uh, your questions. And I thank you for uh, all you've asked today. Keep up the good work. Indeed. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you, for Jim. Thank you for being our teacher. Awesome answers. All that. Sorry. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, did want to uh, thank everyone for being here today. Wanted to thank you for bringing all your great questions and your great vibrations. Thank you to Jim. Thank you to all our uh, friends at uh, LNL Research. Thank you for everyone who's uh, watching this on YouTube at other space time and time space. And uh, until we meet again. In the Love you, Jim. Love you. Love you all too. Yeah. Hope you have a great day. Thank Till you so much, time. Jonathan. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Stay well, again. everyone. Yay. Thanks, Jonathan. Take care. Love you.